All right, the passion and the glory. This is lesson uh, number one in this uh, five part series entitled, uh, of course, The Passion and the Glory and this first lesson, His Last Supper. I want to read a passage from uh, Romans chapter one, verse 16. Paul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Now this gospel that Paul talks about that has the power to save men is the story of Jesus Christ. It's the story of the passion of his death, the glory of his resurrection. Basically, it's the story of God taking on the form of humanity in the person of Jesus and coming to live among men. And mankind was so blinded by their own evil that they plotted to destroy him, they lied in order to convict him, they tortured him and humiliated him and then murdered him and tried to forget him. However, three days after these horrible events, Jesus rose from the dead, leaving his tomb empty. And then he appeared to over 500 people in different places and times for over a period of a month and then in full view of his apostles, he was taken into heaven, leaving them with the promise that one day he would return unexpectedly in order to bring to heaven all those who believed and served him and punish all those who did evil and those who knew of him but refused to believe in him. <clears throat> this gospel that Paul talks about which I have told you in brief form here, is contained in the books of Matthew and Mark, Luke and John. Each writer tells us the same story from his own unique perspective, but all of them climax their witness of Jesus' life with his death and burial and resurrection. And so in this series entitled, The Passion and the Glory, I want to focus on the climactic final moments of Jesus' life where the greatest drama of human history was played out. I want us to be with Jesus at his last supper. I want us to hear his last words. I want us to see his last miracle. I want us to know his last command and I want us to receive his last gift. You know, today in a time when religion is often used as a vehicle for politics or entertainment, I want to share with you the scenes that the apostles experienced, the story that Luke says turned the world upside down when it was told. And he writes this in Acts chapter 17, verse six. I want to tell you about the passion and the glory of Jesus Christ. And so let us therefore begin with his last supper. Now the final weeks of Jesus' life was the week of Passover, culminating in the Passover meal. And if we want to understand properly the significance of the events surrounding Jesus' last days, we need to understand the history of the Jewish Passover. 2,000 years before Christ, God chose and promised to Abraham, who lived in modern day, Turk, uh, modern day Iraq at the time, that he would protect Abraham and give his descendants a special land to live in, and one day send a savior through his people. Abraham's descendants were the Israelites, and through a series of circumstances, the Israelites found themselves in Egyptian slavery for several centuries. God remembered his promises to Abraham and he called one of these people, Moses, to lead the Jewish people out of Egyptian slavery and into the land that God had promised them long before. The Egyptian king refused to allow Moses to bring the people out of Egypt. And so God sent many plagues and catastrophes on Egypt in order to change his mind. The king stubbornly refused despite all the calamities happening in his countries. The final plague sent by God was that the firstborn child uh, and animal of every family would be killed by God's angel on a particular night. 
In order to save the Israelites from this disaster, God instructed Moses to tell the people to do several things. First of all, they had to sacrifice a young lamb without blemish and then sprinkle its blood on the doorposts of their homes. And then they needed to stay inside their homes on that night and eat the sacrificial lamb uh, and share that with their family. And so the Israelites did this and when the angel of death came that night to seek out the firstborn of every house, he passed over those homes where the blood was on the post or the frames of the door. The Egyptians allowed the Israelites to go when they discovered the terrible thing that had happened to them on that night when the firstborn of every Egyptian home, every Egyptian stable had been um, killed. And so God instructed Moses to tell the people that every year thereafter in the spring, they were to keep the Passover meal, if you were, as a remembrance of their liberation from bondage in Egypt. Of course, this happened, as I say, between 1500 and 1400 BC. Well, 1500 years later, by the time of Jesus, the Passover meal had grown into a week festival that included the Passover meal followed by seven days uh, of uh, feasting uh, referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, originally there were two separate feasts. The Passover, in other words, the sharing of the Passover meal on one of these days, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was a separate seven-day feast that followed. By the time of Jesus, these two feasts had merged into one as writers referred to them together as the Passover. So when they said the Passover, they weren't only talking about the meal itself, but they were talking about the meal and the days that follow. Well, during this time, Jews from all over the world would come to Jerusalem in order to sacrifice a lamb at the temple and share a Passover meal with friends and family. Each family or group would purchase a lamb and bring it to the temple to be sacrificed. Now, the meal itself consisted of a roasted lamb, uh, unleavened bread, bitter herbs, things like parsley and escard and cucumber, um, wine, uh, four cups were drunk in ceremonial fashion, accompanied by praise and scripture, um, and um, scripture reading and, and prayer. Since it was Passover and no leaven was permitted, it seemed that they drank new wine, what they called new wine or fruit of the vine or unfermented uh, wine at that particular time and feast. Now, as far as the meal was concerned, this was a, a kind of a ceremonial meal uh, the family would gather and the father or the leader would conduct the meal. Everyone would, uh, at the beginning, wash their hands in a ritual uh, hand washing and then would have their feet washed if they were visiting someone's home. Uh, the first cup of wine was shared and they gave a blessing or a grace. Uh, the father at that point would uh, dip the herbs into the meats and, and to the meat rather and would pronounce a benediction and then he would eat and the others would follow. As I say, it was a ceremonial meal. It wasn't all, all right, buddy, dig in, you know, let's have some fun. No, it was a ceremonial meal. There was a way that they, an order that they followed. The uh, second cup of wine was prepared and at this point, one of the sons, one of the young people would then ask the father to explain the feast and this would provide an occasion to teach the family the significance of what they were doing, as well as tell the story of the Passover in Jewish history. Uh, and so the lamb in, in the story that the father would be uh, telling, the lamb uh, uh, represented the sacrificial lamb and the blood that was covering the doorpost at the time, the protection, that life sacrifice to protect them. The unleavened bread represented purity and holiness of God's people. Also, it represented their rush to leave uh, Egypt uh, that night uh, 
uh, and having no time to allow the bread to rise. And so they, they ate unleavened bread because there was no time to, to bake it and to allow it to rise, as I mentioned. And uh, the bitter herbs, uh, they represented the difficult experience and the suffering that the, Egypt, uh, the Israelites um, uh, experienced while they were in Egyptian bondage. And the wine itself uh, represented a blessing and abundance when they uh, settled in Canaan. The wine, they didn't drink wine on the night of the Passover, but later on when they entered into the, uh, the promised land, they added this element, this wine element, uh, and the wine element uh, represented abundance and, and blessing uh, in the new land where they eventually settled. After finishing the meal, they sang some Psalms, 113 and 114, uh, drank a second cup with prayer and thanksgiving. And at this point, the father would wash his hands and take two portions of bread. One piece he would eat along with the meat and the salad. And of course, the others would do the same until the father would eat the very last piece of lamb and this would signify the end of this meal. After this, there was a third, perhaps a fourth cup with songs and blessings. Uh, we believe that what they sang at the time were the, uh, what's called the Hallel or the praise songs, Psalms 115 to 118. So if you want to get an idea of the, at least the, the words that they used in their songs, uh, simply read the Psalms 113 to uh, 118. And so it was uh, the traditional Passover meal that Jesus ate, Jesus was a Jew, and uh, it was this meal that the Lord had sent Peter and John to prepare for himself and the other apostles uh, that we read about in Luke chapter 22, verses seven to 13. This particular Passover meal, however, was to be special because it would be Jesus' last meal before his death on the cross. So let's take a look at what took place when Jesus celebrated his last uh, Passover meal. We know that uh, Peter and John have gone ahead to prepare the room. The meal was set at a private upper room furnished with a low table in a U shape with cushions surrounding it where the guests would recline. In those days, the host, and in this case it would be John, had the first place on the left uh, so he could see to the needs of the leader or the honored guest uh, uh, who sat next to him and also uh, could protect him from you know, any, dis any uh, disturbance. Um, let's see, and then the rest of the people, of course, were placed in order of age and importance uh, all the way down the line. So you had John, Jesus, the leader, the, you know, the, the guest of honor, if you wish, uh, Judas next to him, and then all the rest of the apostles finishing with Peter at the, um, at the, other, uh, at the other end. We know that Judas sat next uh, or sat to the left of Jesus. And we know this because Jesus offered him a piece of bread to indicate who the traitor was. John chapter 13, verse 21 and 25, 26. Well, he wouldn't be able to reach all the way across the table. It says he just handed it to the person next to him. In this case was Judas. We know that John chose the first or the host position next to Jesus because he leaned on Jesus' breast at some point during the meal. Read about that in John chapter 13, 23 to 25. According to John in chapter 13, four to six, Jesus either started or finished washing the apostles' feet with Peter. So either way, Peter was in the last place on the right. The owner of the house also had left a basin of water and a, a towel in order to allow the guests who had traveled on foot to wash their feet before they entered into the house uh, and take their place at the table to eat. And so they prepared the table by laying out the roasted lamb and the other sacrificial meats, the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread, as well as the wine with the cups uh, for the blessings. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Luke records that there was a dispute among them concerning who was to be regarded as the greatest. Imagine, we're having the Passover meal and the first thing that happens is an argument 
you know, among the apostles to figure out who's the greatest one of them, who's first, who's the most important. Let's read that in Luke chapter, uh, chapter 22. It says, and there arose a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Perhaps John and Judas, in having taken the places closest to Jesus at the table, caused the others to be jealous. And this argument began. Imagine, they said, well, who does he think he is taking the first spot? And look at Judas, you know, we know who Judas is. What's he doing sitting next to Jesus? So you could almost see you know, the argument begin. And so Jesus tells them that in the kingdom, the youngest is the greatest. The one who serves is the most important, according to God, because God is the one who determines uh, everyone's importance, doesn't he? In John chapter 13, two to five, John describes how Jesus underscores this lesson by rising from his honored position at the head of the supper table and taking the basin and the towel, he proceeds to wash all of the apostles' feet. Now we know that uh, usually a slave and, and the slave who was at the, at the bottom, like the youngest boy slave in the house, usually a slave was present at feasts and this, servant was done, this service rather was done by him as a gesture of uh, hospitality by the host. Each apostle, if you note, if you can imagine, could you imagine them walking into the room? They walk into the room, they know their feet are dirty, they know that usually their feet are washed by you know, a slave or someone, an attendant who is there, but there's no one there. There's the bowl, there's the towel. I'm not going to wash my own feet as one of them comes in and another one comes in. And as another one comes in, sees the water, sees the towel, looks at the other apostles who have not washed their own feet and they're all sitting at the table. Well, I'm not going to wash my feet and then go wash their feet. Can't you see human nature you know, crowding in there? So each apostle entered, saw the basin, knew what it was for, but did not wash his own feet and most importantly, didn't offer to wash anybody else's feet either. This task was for slaves. It wasn't meant to be done by those who were interested in position. You know, they were arguing who had the highest position. After this, the Passover meal continues with the usual procedure. Jesus serving as the leader, distributing the food. During the meal, all four gospel writers indicate that Jesus reveals to the apostles that there is a traitor among their number. For example, Matthew 26, 21 mentions this. Uh, they are to be sure mortified at this point and they start to question themselves and Jesus as to whom it might be. So let's kind of piece together what happened by you know, putting together the stories in each of the gospels. So in Mark 14, Mark tells us that when Jesus said this, they all asked him saying, surely not I. And Jesus answered nothing. Luke, in Luke 22, 23 says that they also discussed among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. In Matthew 26, Matthew records that when, G, uh, when Judas asked the question, surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered him, you have, said, you have said it yourself. And this is a Hebrew way of saying, what you say is what you are. And then of course, it is left to John, who is seated next to Jesus, he has the true vantage point here, to describe what happened at this point. So let's just read John's account. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. 
there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. See, that would be John. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Now the apostles knew that Judas was a thief. In John 12, uh, verse six, John says that he used to steal the money from the money box. Now they knew him to be a traitor, but they're not quite aware uh, exactly uh, you know, what, his, what his plan might be. And so Judas leaves and goes into the, into the night. There remains on the table only a piece of unleavened bread to be eaten and the final cup of blessing to offer a prayer of thanksgiving in remembrance for the freedom God gave to the Israelites from Egyptian bondage long years before. But Jesus at this point changes the focus of the group here from the past, because what they were doing was commemorating the past. He changes that focus and turns it to be looking to the future. We read in Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so the bread without leaven no longer represented the holiness and the purity of the people or the holiness and purity that they should have, but now the unleavened bread will represent his holy and pure body given for them in sacrifice. The wine will no longer represent the blessing and abundance of the promised land, but now will represent his blood in other words, his life freely given to purify all men from sin and guarantee the promise of an abundant eternal life. There'll be no more lamb to kill and sacrifice for Jesus is the lamb of God whose blood will cover and protect his people forever. Not just for one night, like that sacrificial lamb long ago, but from here on in the blood of Jesus that covers the Christian will cover him every night, every night of his life, until he dies and is with God forever. Um, there will no longer be bitter herbs as a memory of suffering, because the memory of his suffering will be eclipsed by the glory of his resurrection from the dead. This is Jesus' last Passover, but it will also be their last Passover. From now on, they will remember this night and share the bread and the wine to remind them of their freedom from sin and death to life and glory through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It was a custom to end the meal with songs of praise and thanksgiving. And so Matthew and Mark write that after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, Matthew 26, verse 30. They probably sang, as I mentioned before, Psalms 113 to 115, known as the Hallel, Hallel, uh, meaning joyous praise and joyous praise and song. And so the lamb of the Passover had been sacrificed and eaten, but now as Jesus and the apostles left the solitude of the upper room, the true lamb of God was being prepared for sacrifice. 
After supper, the writers each describe how Jesus prepared the apostles for what was to come by telling them very plainly that soon he will be tortured and killed and they will all run away. Matthew and Mark write that the apostles insist that they are ready to die with Jesus and Peter says he would never deny Jesus. The Lord tells him that even before the cock crows, he will deny him three times. Luke tells us that Jesus prayed for Peter at this point so that Satan will not overpower him and that Peter will have strength to encourage others. Luke says that in a panic, the apostles take two swords with them. Of course, John is the one who gives us the longest description of this time where Jesus not only warns the apostles, but he prays for them as well. In John chapter 14, verse one, all the way through to John 17, verse 26, almost four chapters uh, where John is describing Jesus' prayer. We'll just summarize it here. He prays for the apostles that they might love one another, the, tr the true sign of authentic discipleship. He prays that, they, that he will prepare a place in heaven for them. He prays for that, but he also promises them. Uh, he prays that the Holy Spirit will be given to strengthen and, given, uh, and give them power. Another uh, uh, prayer of promise for the uh, apostles. He prays that, um, uh, uh, that they will remember him as the true vine. And so long as they remain faithful, they will be fruitful and that God sanctify and purify them in truth and keep them united with each other and himself and with God the Father. And so Jesus' prayer for them and, and his offering of blessings on them uh, is summarized in these few points that I've mentioned this. After he's done all of this, he and the apostles make their way to the Mount of Olives, uh, bringing their swords with them. Now the Mount of Olives was outside of the city, um, a place frequented by those who wished for solitude and a time uh, for prayer. It was actually an olive grove and there was an olive press there, but it was also used as a kind of a, a garden. Uh, it, was on the, it was on the crest of a hill. And uh, when you are there at the Mount of Olives, which th that location is still there, uh, uh, you, 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 you were there at the Mount of Olives and you look across the valley, there's a valley you go down and across the valley on the hill across the way is the city of Jerusalem. It's usually from the Mount of Olives, all those, those photographs that you see of Jerusalem and the golden dome and all that there, uh, the, usually those pictures are taken from the Mount of Olives. And so they make their way out of the city, go down into the valley, up the hill, to, the, uh, uh, to um, the Mount of Olives, the Garden of uh, Gethsemane. Um, the 11 follow him to the edge of the garden and he brings Peter and James and John further in, asking them to pray with him because he's becoming sad and heavy with pain. Matthew and Mark describe how Jesus wrestled in prayer, asking God to take away the cup of violence that he faced. Three times he returned to the apostles for their encouragement and prayer support. Three times he found them asleep, heavy with fear and sorrow. Luke tells us in Luke 22, 43 and 44 that Jesus was in such agony, he sweat blood. And this is not a myth or anything, it's an actual medical condition called hematidrosis. And it's caused by severe stress and mental anguish to the point where an angel came to, to strengthen him. In the end, the battle to bring his human will under complete control of the heavenly Father is won as Jesus accepts the cross with the words, my Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. It wasn't Jesus' divine nature that was struggling with this, it was his human nature. And it would not have been normal for him not to struggle. What human being would, knowing the suffering and the agony that awaited them, would willingly go into such a thing? And so Jesus, very much human, struggles with that decision. 
And so in the end, as I say, the battle to bring his human will uh, 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 under control, uh, under the uh, uh, authority of the uh, father is, is, finally, um, is finally won. After returning to the 11 at the edge from his prayer, they hear the sound of a crowd and the clanging of swords and they see the light of torches in the night. Judas has agreed to identify Jesus to the crowd by greeting him with a kiss. John tells us in John 18, three that he has Roman soldiers and guards from the temple of the priests as well as some Pharisees with him. And Jesus receives the kiss and tells them to leave the apostles alone and when they hear his voice, they're so startled, they, they kind of go back and they fall back on each other to the ground. And at that point, Peter seizes the opportunity and he uses one of the swords to cut off the ear of one of the high priest's servants named Malchus. In Matthew, Matthew 26, 52 tells us that Jesus healed that man's ear and stopped Peter uh, from any further violence. In John chapter 18, 11, John writes that Jesus accepted to be taken in order to fulfill the will of God when he said, put your sword away Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And Mark closes this chapter simply by saying, and they all left him and fled. Mark 14, verse 50. And so, like a lamb for the Passover sacrifice, Jesus was bound and led away into his night of extreme suffering. We close with that uh, passage uh, tonight or today and we will continue next week with the passion and the glory when we will examine Jesus's last words. Today we did the last Passover, next time we'll do the last words. Thank you for your attention, appreciate it.